right on Book Reports Podcast. Murdery. Word Cops. Splatnik. Sam Needs to Listen. Dobby. Idaho. And much, much more. Welcome to Book Reports Podcast, a monthly podcast of high literary discussion and lowbrow humor. My name is Bryce Diener. And I'm Sam Tyler. And our special guests this week... Wait, this, Bryce, is that a plural? That is. We have two, and it's not just multiple personality disorder, there's two <laughs> literal human bodies here with us. <laughs> Welcome, Ivy and Rory Tamlin. Hi. <laughs> that was Ivy applauding herself. <laughs> It's, it's nothing except, you know, self-confidence, and that's what you got to have in life. <laughs> Especially on this podcast, because we're going to tear you down. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much for being on the show today. <laughs> we are delighted. Ivy, you are a chiropractor, right? Correct. And Rory, you are a... You are also a chiropractor. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, I'm a student at Bloomsburg University. What is your major? Did you pick one yet? Yep, I'm a bio major. Like chemicals and no. stuff? Okay. No. <laughs> I like botanical sciences. Botanical? Oh, very nice. Yeah. So, like, what kind of literature are you guys into, if any? Oh, man. I like everything. Mainly fiction. I'm not a big fan of nonfiction. I like science fiction. You aren't going to like my book. Oh, darn. <laughs> I might leave for that part. <laughs> what specific kinds of fiction? You said science fiction and anything else? Fantasy. Fantasy? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, that's pretty far into my genres. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I'm the odd one out. because uh, historical. Yeah, yeah I, I like... Historical so, fiction or history? Um, both. Oh, fantastic. And, and I'm also a real eclectic reader. You know, I would like to be reading three, four books at a time, and depending on mood, I'll be reading a religious book, and then fiction, and then a biography, and then a science-based book, and okay. I like diversity. That's sort of what I am, too, only it's more based on what bathroom is nearest and what books are in it. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> but, uh, yes. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I do. <laughs> Do you have a book you read this month? No, I didn't. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> the book I chose to read this month is called The Professor and the Madman, a tale of murder, insanity, and the making of the Oxford English Dictionary. If you only read one book about the Oxford English Dictionary this year, make sure it's this one. <laughs> Does that include the actual Oxford English Dictionary? No. Okay. Because <laughs> there's several volumes of multiple books. So... <laughs> If you only read one Oxford English Dictionary, make sure it's A through Ant. That's a that's my favorite one. Yeah. This is nonfiction. Yes. Yes, correct. Okay. This this actually happened. The whole idea is that with the Oxford English Dictionary, it wasn't necessarily the first dictionary that was created. There were other dictionaries before it. They were saying like they mentioned Shakespeare possibly having like almost like a dictionary of words that he could go to to kind of define things, and then he would continue to add to by making up brand new words exactly. like French woman. Yes. Yeah. I believe he made up apple of my eye. So well, he made up a lot of good phrases for yes. us. I can just make any statement there because no one's read all of Shakespeare, really. So <laughs> at least anyone who's listening to our podcast. <laughs> uh, let's, let's be honest. We love you listeners, but we know you're illiterate. <laughs> <laughs> we know who you are. <laughs> It's Professor and the Madman. Sounds like a, a, an early morning like radio team. <laughs> Welcome to Professor and the Madman. I'm the professor. <laughs> Coming up next, Blink-182. <laughs> Today's word, Aardvark. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there were definitely like dictionaries before this, but what Dr. James Murray, who they all was... sucked. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and so most of those dictionaries only covered like unique words, like chrysanthemum or I don't yes. know. I, I don't know a lot of unique words, I guess. Okay. So it, it was a book designed to give you words you didn't know already? Yeah, exactly. Word common usage? Yeah. And okay. so like like for our intro, Welcome to Book Reports Podcast, none of those words would have made it in because those are very common words. Whereas if you said literary discussion, like maybe the word discussion would have made it into one of these, but... The idea with Dr. James Murray, who was kind of in charge of the Oxford English Dictionary, was he said, I want every single word in the English language as best as we can. So articles like A, and and the... Overachiever. Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Um, And also what was unique... I want everything on my Christmas list this year, mother. Everything. (laughs) I'm a doctor. I'm a doctor. So was there murder, mystery, intrigue in this book? Or? No. The, oh. the title is very deceptive. <laughs> oh. Okay. No, I'm, I'm kidding. No, I guess I'll move on to uh, Another thing before we get to the murdery, insanity, and intrigue. Murder. Um, what's 
The murdering. Was that in his dictionary? <laughs> the murdering. 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 <laughs> and sanatine. What was unique about this dictionary, the OED, as I will... Uh, oh, you're so cool. You know, short. <laughs> uh, who has time to say Oxford English Dictionary every single time? Not this guy. Uh, what was unique about it was instead of just one single person doing the dictionary, he sent out like newspaper ads and stuff like that to every newspaper in England. I think some of them came to America as well. And what they said was, hey, read these like certain rare books as far back as like old English would go. If you're willing to read this book, I'll send it to you mm-hmm. if we have the book. And then you just send it back with little note cards. Mm-hmm. You wrote the word on top, wrote the quotation where you found it in the book, the page number, which book it was, how the word is defined. They're finding every word that they think they can define. Okay. And so he's having to remind people because they're like, oh, I didn't find any unique words. And he's like, I want every word. <laughs> yeah. um, and so he's getting frustrated. But like this We're, is like the first dictionary that is collaborated by hundreds of different people instead of just one single person. Did, did they pay the people to do no. this? No. These, so they were volunteers. Their effort. These were just lovers wow, of books. Wow, that's pretty cool. And they're like, hey... I was going to say, you know, I could just like, uh, yeah, it's splotic. Uh, It's a word, you know, and just just make up a whole list if I needed to. But you have to cite your source, and they're like, wow, this guy, Sam, has given us a lot of words that don't exist. (laughs) It's in the dictionary. Look it up. Oh, no way. I'm sorry. (laughs) Now, what what time period are they doing this in? This book takes place after the Civil War. Okay. So that's when the OED is being written. Uh, The OED actually finishes in 1920. They would mail these little note cards with the words back, and they noticed that this one guy, Dr. W.C. Minor was sending in a lot more than anybody else. And then Dr. James Murray's like, wow, I gotta like meet this guy. He must be a surgeon because he's very well scripted and like especially like the medical terms. And so he writes him a letter, he's like, I'd love to meet you. Dr. Minor says, Oh, you're welcome to come by. And so he meets Dr. Minor and finds out that his address that he's been giving is actually in a sane asylum, and he's been in there many years that he was a Civil War surgeon. During the Civil War, he had to brand a Irish soldier who ran away and they caught him. And that caused him to kind of go insane, think that the Irish in general were just going to come after him. Mm-hmm. As an Irishman myself, I'm very offended by that. We definitely would have. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> watch out, Dr. Minor, we're coming for you. <laughs> and so we get the story of he's afraid of the Irish. For some reason, he moves to England. He starts having these hallucinations. He is later diagnosed with dementia. But at this time, that word didn't even exist in what is called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, for those of you who know what that is. Next month's book. Yeah. (laughs) That's like 800 pages. Great read. (laughs) It's the Dictionary of Mental Disorders, so, you know, because I know the (laughs) word. I'm right there. I'm right there. And I know her. (laughs) Splotnik. (laughs) Splotnik. While he's in England, he has this hallucination that... The Irish are breaking into his room at night, trying to poison him. He wakes up one night with a gun running into the street. He sees a guy walking away, assumes that man was just in his room. Where he shoots him. Sorry? Where did he get the gun in an insane asylum? He, he wasn't at the insane okay. asylum at this time. Okay. This is, okay. And so he so goes to trial. Was England having hallucinations before right. being in this asylum. Correct. Okay. And so because of the murder of this random gentleman Colors in the don't street, run, Rory. Colors don't run. <laughs> But blood does in the street because he shot him. (laughs) So he shoots this guy, uh, kills him. He's sent to an insane asylum, and that is where he starts writing letters actually to the widow of the man he shot and says, you know, I apologize for this. Uh, It's because of my disorder that I'm like this. They start to build a friendship, and he's like, hey, can you start sending me books? Because he loves to read. He actually has two... The widow is... is, He sends sends him books. Uh, in one of these books is a news clipping from Dr. James Murray that says, hey, if you can start reading books. Yes. That's really cool. Uh, and that's how these two become connected. And so that's where we get the murder insanity and Oxford English Dictionary. So and they collaborated after that? They actually met several times after that. They became friends, even though the one gentleman was not allowed to leave the insane asylum. Dr. James Murray died maybe 10 years before Dr. Minor did. <laughs> and it was before the... OED was actually finished, so he never got to see his work oh. actually finished. Yeah. And so it was about 1920 that the last uh, word, I think it was like Z Y X T. I was wondering, was it written in order of letter? Because if the last word is. Yeah, so they, they went alphabetically. And, and the unique thing that about. That strikes me as a little bit of a waste, you know, not to just compile as much as you can. But I guess, I guess right. for the sake of order, I guess it makes right. sense. Yeah, I mean, that's how the English were. They were very orderly. How self-restrained. I want to do K today. Now. <laughs> Get me some of those K's. Yeah. <laughs> Vitamin K. Run through the thing. 
stuff. You, uh, you just get cravings sometimes. <laughs> so most people would just like start sending like slips like cravings. Oh, I found like a, a weird oh, letter for S. Or something. <laughs> so they would send them in. Whereas yes. uh, Doctor Minor was like, oh, what letter or what word are you guys working on? Mm-hmm. The uh, scriptorium would send him a few of the ones he's working on. It's like he never sent them in unless he was asked or like he asked them, what are you huh. working on? So he had a whole filing cabinet. I was like, oh, there's this word, there's this word. Here you go. And he mailed those in. And suddenly they're like, man, we're having trouble with like, this word. Let's mail Dr. Minor a letter and see if he's got him. And sure enough, most of the, so he's contributed thousands yeah. of words to the OED. Wow. And so he's a huge reason that we have yes. so many words in the Oxford English Dictionary. That's really That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. By the way, I forgot to mention the author is Simon Winchester, which is a very English name. Simon Winchester. Yes. Private Eye. The third. <laughs> Esquire. Word cops. <laughs> Word cops. <laughs> Word cops. <laughs> like, they're, they're always carrying, a, like, a thesaurus with them. It's like, you're under arrest or in custody or... <laughs> you're being restrained. Yeah. <laughs> and this is a book about the dictionary. Yes. Did you learn any new words? Well, what's nice is that at the beginning of each chapter, they do oh. have a word... I- ah! They, they don't mention if <laughs> that's fantastic. If said word is actually so, it's, it's an entry from the dictionary at the beginning of every single chapter. Exactly, that is and so, so cool. They didn't mention if like this specific word was submitted by Doctor Minor or not. If he didn't submit polymath, nobody could have. <laughs> I skipped that one because I couldn't pronounce it. So I went to the next chapter and went to <laughs> lunatic. <laughs> And so it like it starts going into like his madness, and yes. so like it's definitely understandable. Oh, what a clever way to divide yes. the book! Yeah, that's so smart and so and, simple. And it does mention too, if you know the word bedlam. Yeah, yes. you know where yeah. that comes from. Named after Bedlam, <laughs> Bethlehem, which is the right. name of a lunatic asylum mm-hmm. that was in England, and it was in such terrible disrepair and such terrible care to its patients. Got well, the word Bedlam. It's and an so, asylum from the 1800s. That yeah. was a pretty low bar, really. Uh, I mean, well, I mean, even for that, like Bedlam came for that word, and so if something is described as Bedlam, it's not really a good thing, and so that's where it came from. And it's interesting, like with my psychology background, like I know a lot of the history of psychology and the way that patients were treated. And and like compared to what they were treated back then, like we care about them so much more today. We're more focused on like medication and trying to get people better. Back then, it was definitely let's lock them up, keep them out of society because well, they can't contribute. Hasn't. Well, I, I would also say it's, they also didn't have treatment for them. It's not that they didn't exactly. care; it's just yeah. they couldn't do a darn thing with them except lock them up and have people come in and have paid tours to look at them yeah. about the best they could do, really. Yeah, except for you know water cures, I suppose, and so on. But or leeches, I'm sure that was a thing for no reason. <laughs> Well, a lot, a lot of the cures for, for psychiatric psychiatric problems tended to be more based on behavioral issues as opposed to actually curing them, you know, fixing right. specific behaviors uh, with punishment or with yeah. stimulation, that kind mm-hmm. of thing, as opposed to actual cures, just letting it out or keeping it in. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's definitely interesting, like, they, they locked them up and, you know, as a man with dementia... You're they, not a man with dementia. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> That's the dementia talking. Not <laughs> Bryce drove here, everyone. <laughs> Bryce drove by here. myself. <laughs> no, as as Doctor Miner had his dementia, I definitely think like if it were to happen today, it's something they could have caught early enough that they could have treated. Yeah. Because as he got older, it definitely got worse. He thought people were breaking into his cell. He cut off a certain body part. Of his own? Of his own. Oh, have that you're not um, mentioning? Yes. Oh, because spleen. I'm trying to keep the explicit tag off of the podcast. <laughs> so, yes, his spleen. His Dobby. His Dobby? His Dobby. <laughs> his Dobby was definitely freed. <laughs> this book just took a whole new direction. <laughs> I really bad when I read this book. Not <laughs> from Oxford. I almost <laughs> wanted to read nonfiction, and now I don't. <laughs> you were on the verge, and I pushed yeah. you way off. Don't worry, from side. the dictionary to self mutilation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yikes. Yeah, for some reason, he was the only oh. prisoner allowed to have a pocket knife because he said he wanted to trim the makes pages sense. off his oh, prison okay, editions. That's true, that's true. Yeah, and probably scrape off old ink and so on. That yeah. makes sense. That makes sense. And, and so body parts. He, yeah, did he say why he cut off his um, He did, which I won't go into detail. Okay. okay. But it's definitely read, in the book. Read the book. So, read teasers. The book. Yeah, yeah, teaser. <laughs> if you want to know why he cut off his dog, read the book. <laughs> Or visit your local library. <laughs> Ask for it by name. <laughs> I'm looking for a book about someone's dog. <laughs> ah, Chamber of Secrets, over in the kids' section. <laughs> uh, <A> little Dobby. <laughs> Mom, <laughs> cool it. <laughs> so that was my book. Now, I think 
you guys actually read the same book, right? Yeah, we did. Okay. Yes. All the light we cannot see by Anthony Dewar. Yep. I read this last summer. Last summer. Okay. Mm-hmm. Is it fiction, nonfiction? Is it fantasy? It's historical fiction. Historical fiction. So yes. it didn't happen, but it could have in the past. Oh, yes. For it's, those who don't know what a historical yes. fiction is. <laughs> It's, it's Look a, it up in the Oxford English Dictionary. <laughs> the OED. Coming back around. <laughs> it's a World War II era book. It takes place in both Germany and in France. It'll rip your heart out. was <laughs> the 2015 Pulitzer Prize winner. Really? Yes, it wow. was. For and chemistry or? Oh, no, that's a no, Pulitzer Prize fighter. <laughs> Pulitzer Prize fighter? <laughs> This book pulls no punches. <laughs> it rips your heart out. This sounds terrible. I didn't care for the story much at all. I really read it. The book itself was just sort of a work of art, and it took him 10 years to write it. It was really fun to read and learn more as a writer myself from it. Now, what you're saying, it's it's the writing style as opposed to the story? Yes. So what, what's some of the, the, big, the big stylistic choices in the book? Every sentence is perfect. Like, wow! I, I don't know. His pray. Is, is his you know how like sometimes you spend a lot of time mm-hmm. and you're just like, oh well, that sentence was just perfect. It explained exactly what I wanted to communicate. Every a, single sentence was like that. Do you guys have an excerpt you can you can pop in? <laughs> I do, but um, you know, I, I agree with Rory that as far as a storyline goes. It would not have been my favorite either, and, mm. and not to give a spoiler, but it is not a happy read. No. It is not a fun read. He, I he remember, very much. I remember crying, at picking up Gabe from soccer because that's what I invented. <laughs> and you know, he he raises a lot of questions about empathy hmm? huh. and can flawed can flawed people and flawed characters be heroes or heroines? Can mm. they, in the midst of life circumstances and tragedies, you know, who who rises? To greater character, but it's something that his writing style is so interesting. And I, I said and to her, I would I would read him if he wrote a groceries list. You know, that, <laughs> oh, oh. So it, it has more to do with the way he writes things. But hmm. yeah. I mean, like there's redemption at the end, but then everyone not everyone, but in my mind, everyone died. <laughs> it, it is two parallel stories concerning an orphan boy named Werner yeah. who ends up being. Is he a German orphan? Or- yes. Is he a yes. German orphan? Yes. Yes. And German he's, I just read this in this morning. And he's, he's a prodigy who is gifted in mathematics and radio. builds a radio from scratch, which wow. is very important at the time because yeah. it's his avenue into elite Hitler Youth School in which he learns how to do radio transmission triangulation. They, they oh, lie about okay. his age when yes. he's 16. They say he's 18 so that he can go yes. along with the soldiers. Because okay. so, he was like in such high demand because he was so good at what he did. Hmm. Wow. Then the other protagonist, Marie Laurie, is... It was a blind girl living in France with her dad, but then her dad worked at the Museum of Natural History. History, And he was given some diamond, I think. The Sea of Flames is a very unique diamond that the Nazis would like to get a hold of. Uh, Three gentlemen are commissioned to secret two fakes and one real out of Paris. And of course, this travels with them. He creates a model of the city oh, for his daughter because she's blind. Hmm. Yes, and <laughs> and they, they a model of the city for, for his, his blind daughter. daughter so that she can feel it and yes. learn her way around the city. Okay, so finger walks through. But he was really bad at it, and she got lost right away. <laughs> <laughs> no, the scale was off really it was, badly. It was very well. Oh. So they they refugee to Saint Malo, which is on the coast, to the great uncle's house, and. He was he really that great of an uncle? No. I mean, not that great. No, okay. he, was a, he was a World War One survivor with oh, a post-traumatic stress great. disorder. So okay. he's he's a little mad as the great well. Great war for well. great uncle. <laughs> and oh no, that's a... so, they're, they're, so. It's like their story, like both separately going and then converge for like maybe part of one chapter. I would forewarn someone yeah. when they begin that the opening chapters he jumps around. Mm-hmm. So okay, okay. he is speaking of their early childhood. And then he repeatedly goes to the time of crisis when St. Malo is being bombed mm. hmm. and their stories are getting closer and closer. And oh, that's clever. To okay. Meeting. So, so it's, it's not just his writing style, but it's also the structure of the book that yes. gives the book a, a yeah. further interest. That's it, pretty he, You know something's coming. Yes. You know they're going right. to meet at some point. Yes. Is that's she cool. one of the ones that takes the diamond out? Okay. Yes, at the very end. After, the, after they meet, it's just heartbreak the rest of the way through. So, <laughs> Just like real friendships. Yeah. Anthony Dewar has 
um, this knack for very odd, quirky side stories oh, okay. where he'll give you a little crumb and then pick it up later on. One of those that I really like is when Werner and his sister oh, can listen okay. to the radio. They hear these wonderful science broadcasts from this Frenchman, and he is so entranced by what he's learning from this. You find out much, much, much later in the book, this is Marie Laure's great uncle, hmm. and they made records oh, and wow. transmitted this from his house. Oh, that's cool. And that actually factors in later to how he finds her. Hmm. So, and there's lots of those little snippets. So, if, you I know, really, I wish they had done more yeah. with his his friend from his school that he went to, Frederick. Yeah. Uh, I think Frederick was my favorite character from the book. Most tragic. But yes. Yeah. But <laughs> the the, t- the oh. years spent in in the Hitler oh. Youth movement were not happy years. And yeah, I should say so. so. Yeah. yeah, I'm not really sure. Is there any point in the book where they are happy? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> I mean, there's the common theme running throughout, too, about light. This is because of her blindness, and yet she is still probably one of the most capable people within the book. Also, the issue of invisibility of the spectrum and how this plays a part in light being waves and then with Werner's connection to all of the mathematics and sound waves and all of that. Oh, okay. Huh. And, and then there's also, you know, the metaphorical light as far as that they are in a very, very dark time. Mm-hmm. And that they there are these moments of, and... of light that mm-hmm. so a lot of recurrent themes mm-hmm. all around you know this concept of light. That's what it seems like a well crafted book. It is. Yeah. Yes. It took him ten years to write it. So he obviously invested a lot of himself. In if he lost the manuscript for like three times. <laughs> eight years. <laughs> <laughs> I left it right here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, he, he repeatedly has a quote from, from the great uncle where he says, open your eyes and see what you can with them before they close forever. Which, you saying that to the blind girl? Uh, no, no. Oh, because that's just rude. <laughs> open your eyes, blind girl. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it is something that the uncle would, would repeatedly say in his record teachings mm-hmm. that he would broadcast oh, okay. and teaching them about science. And, and he had a very enthusiastic way of doing things, but he would always you know, tell them to look at the wonder of the world around you. So they were very... They're interested in shells and mollusks and insects and the wonder of nature. Mm-hmm. So, well, thank you. That that's a yeah. that sounds like a really good book. It is. Has he mm-hmm. written any other books? He Wait did. Wait another ten years. Um, not anything recently. His that's published out. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> he was kind of an unknown, okay. which uh-huh. you know broke him onto the scene big time. But sure. he mm-hmm. he had had I think two two books of short stories. And he's been someone who would write for different newspapers, and he would also write for different science publications as well. Hmm. And his degree is in history. Uh, interestingly enough, his, he and his family, they live in Idaho. And uh, <laughs> so, but, but I do some but I while you're there. He, while he was researching this book, he, he had a, a duration that he was living in Europe, in oh, order okay. to, okay, that to have the the right founding in that, but I can't um, how much disdain you had when you just said Idaho. Oh, yeah. just, no, I, that, that was <laughs> apologies to our Idaho listeners. Yeah. That was surprise. It was surprise because yeah. no one lives there. <laughs> <laughs> no one this smart can live in Idaho. <laughs> You misunderstood my tone. <laughs> the fact that you had a tone. Idaho. <laughs> Today's episode brought to you by Idaho potatoes. <laughs> Don't go there, just eat them. Yes. <laughs> the flyover states. <laughs> this book clearly has a, a point to make and a, a very strong perspective. Did yeah. you guys learn anything from it? I really like that there is childhood wonder that certain people, I think, are able to retain Mm -hmm. that interest and enthusiasm into adulthood. And also, you know, the idea that people have natural proclivities towards certain interests. Mm -hmm. And if they're if they're given mentoring and they're given help, you know, how much it elevates them, how they're able to really chase a dream. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's more about who they are. You know, again, that that issue on the empathy, that there's a lot, a lot of personal decision-making about what is right and what is wrong yeah, in that a, era. There were a lot of, he went mm-hmm. over a lot of morals and ethics kind of with yeah. Werner, him growing up, because his friend was 
had really strong ethics and wanted to do what was right all the time, but Werner was struggling because he was in this school and being mm-hmm. taught one thing mm-hmm. and wasn't yeah. quite sure what was right for himself, kind of until the end, I guess. Yeah. But so that theme of mentoring seemed to come up a lot in the synopsis uh, between, mm-hmm. you know, Hitler Youth building a model of the town mm-hmm. to be able to help her learn yeah. and the, the science records. Was that was that kind of a, a strong... Like, what, what, what do you have to say about mentoring and the importance of that in the book? That there were certain people who definitely filled those gaps. Mm-hmm. Um, when when Marie Lord lives with her her great uncle, and he is not capable of caring for her, and her father is arrested mm-hmm. and and taken to a concentration camp, she is left with their servant. And you know, so here we have a blind girl and an elderly woman who become involved in French resistance. Oh, and, <laughs> and they receive the codes baked in bread uh-huh. and bring this back. You know, so that and the great uncle can yeah. so the great uncle can broadcast to the Allies, and they play a significant part in the resistance. It's not your quintessential, you know, heroine type of thing, right, right, right. but you know, the the elderly maid plays a mentor. And you know, at one point, um, they're talking about you know if if you could have your code name. What would you be? And this eighty year old woman <laughs> says. I would be the blade, you know? <laughs> not what you picture, you know, the elderly French maid saying. So, you know, they're, they're, they're night certain, viper. Yes. And, and when, she, like, but when when she's at the Museum of Natural History, many of the professors take an interest. I mean, it, it's born of pity for this mm-hmm. this little girl, but they also all enjoy her enthusiasm and learning, and they they all mentor her. Oh, that's pretty well. cool. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So there were some happy things. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few. Just, yes. every Just enough to keep your reading. And not well. everyone dies. Now, being that both of you read it, who read it first and then suggested it to the other one? Did you? I did. I did, uh, yes. And, and you said you yeah. might like this? Wait, or and I, was, I kind of was like, I don't know. I don't really care for mm-hmm. mom's genre that she prefers. <laughs> yeah. And she's like, just read it. So I started reading it. I'm like, oh, wow. Like, this was, I just started reading it mainly because I liked the way he wrote. You, you know? know, with your own family and your closest friends, when you make a book recommendation, Recommendation, if it might be something right. that they can appreciate. I, I finished sure. and I came back and I'm like, yeah. why did you make me read this? This is the most terrible <laughs> ending in the world. Because, because then I could say, and she's just smiling. She's like, come here, and let me hug you. Yeah. <laughs> she's just smiling at me and I'm like, why? <laughs> Does this make you more interested in the genre, or just more interested in that writer's work? Or just destroy bit. your trust in your mother? All of the above. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I guess I. I do have an appreciation a little bit more for historical fiction. I still, I'm not a big fan of just straight up historical fiction. Like, I've, I've liked historical fiction that was about this area that I've read by local authors. Okay. I've liked historical fiction that's combined with fantasy. I like yeah. those kinds of things. Yeah. Okay, what, what is your top historical fantasy pick? Leviathan. Leviathan, okay. Have you read that? I have not, but I'm aware and I love the covers. I was going to (laughs) say, you can borrow, I have all of them. I shall have I was going to say Twilight, but (laughs) that is historical. It's not happening now. It's it's not happening now. (laughs) Is it technically all fiction, historical fiction at that point? That's very true. Mm. You're so. Mm. And if it's not now, it will be later. This is the high literary discussion. Future science fiction. Oh, yes. That is absolutely right. Yeah. What's new becomes old again. Mm. It's interesting when you said that about if, you know, if it's not historical now, you know, yeah. that it, I was just reading uh, an article where Stephen King had received some, you know, award for his prolific writing and how... Very prolific. This, yes. And, and how many um, mm. best-selling authors are criticized and chastised because of not being, you know, highbrow literature right. and how there's, there's this snobbery that exists in critical review. Yeah. And he had made a comment where he said how, for those who, who criticize, he said, you are actually out of touch with your own culture. Does that make you a better critic? And hmm. uh, you know, I, I thought, wow, that was profound. <laughs> Singer. <laughs> yeah. yeah and, that's pretty good. And, you know, they, being able to look back and look at how Charles Dickens, you know, um, Salinger, you know, all, hmm. Catsby, you know, all of these people were criticized and were torn down for mm-hmm. their literary endeavors as, as, you know, being too infantile. And, and yet they've held the test of time, but, which raises the question for contemporary fiction. Mm-hmm. We don't know what's going to stand the test of time. But I, I think too, also the, I mean, all throughout history, it's <laughs> not the stuff that sells. In the- <laughs> 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 Darn right. Twilight. <laughs> Twilight by Ralph Lauren. That's pretty funny. 
<laughs> so you were saying? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think Stephen King raises a good point in that genre fiction is the mainstream fiction now. I mean, Walking right. Dead uh, kind of proves that. The Marvel superhero movies right. prove that. It's been that way for the past hundred years or so. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. mystery fiction, science fiction, fantasy, and so on have become the dominant forms of literature right. that anything that isn't falling into a genre anymore right. is just sort of being written to not exist in genre at right. this point. Hmm. And that's the point it's making, which is kind of a shame. One of the cool things, like you had mentioned Stephen King, what I like about him is that he definitely supports like the up-and-coming type yeah, of producer. Like, yeah. If they want to do one of his books as a movie, all they have to do is like pay him a dollar, I think it is. <laughs> Whereas like most authors... Just like, to write a script. Oh, is that what it is? Okay. To, I think. And I think that's how <laughs> Shawshank Redemption Silver Fox. came into being, mm-hmm. was it was one of those movies like that someone just paid the dollar to write the script and <laughs> it just became it was a flop at first and so it was cheap yeah. to yeah. to show it on TV because it was yeah. such a flop and because they showed it over and over again it's the same with the uh, A Christmas Story and A Christmas that Story. one could that have remained a flop that is a <laughs> hallmark of mm-hmm. television okay so. Darren McGavin aside I, I'm not a big fan of that movie sorry who? the oh I'm not the fan <laughs> here huh? I'm not the fan huh? yeah is that what we're saying? okay no, Darren McGavin. He's Kolchak. Shaq? That's fine. All right. No, Sha- Darren- Shaquille okay, O'Neal okay. is not in that movie. Right. I don't right. know if you've uh, seen it. Okay, Darren McGavin <laughs> plays the father in A Christmas Story. He's okay. also Kolchak, the Night Hunter from the 70s TV series. How are you going to tie this it's in? Like, <laughs> it's, it's like X-Files, but in the 70s, he plays this newspaper man who just constantly encounters the supernatural and has to deal with it because nobody believes him. Okay. It's fantastic. Kolchak, the Night Stalker. It's great. I, I have it all on DVD, guys. Oh, <laughs> and Kolchak. that's where it will remain. It's at great. your house. It's great. <laughs> it is great. Uh, do you have anything else you want to ask or any other points you guys want to make? We still haven't gotten an excerpt from the book, by the way. <laughs> yes, you did. She read it. She read it, yeah. What? But I, I must have clawed off completely. I didn't, I didn't do one for mine either. I missed it completely. Other than the one word. Right. <laughs> What'd you read? Just just the one line about, her, you know, at the uncle. end of his records. Oh, yes. Open yes, your yes, eyes, yes. blind girl. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Open your eyes, Sam. Come on. I'm my ears Blind girl. Blind <laughs> no, <I'm laughs> girl. You're such a blind girl. I'm sorry. All right, Sam needs to listen. That's that's just some good life advice. (laughs) My book that I read this month is An Odd Bestiary or a compendium of instructive and entertaining descriptions of animals culled from five centuries of traveler's accounts, natural histories, zoologies, etc. by other authors famous and obscure arranged as an abcadary, designed and illustrated by Alan James Robinson. I have a question. Mm. Yeah. Do, Was that the whole it, book? I've heard it pronounced yeah. the way you've pronounced bestiary it. Bestiary or I've bestiary? Also, yes, I've yeah. heard bestiary as well. Is there a correct way? Get the dictionary. Uh, <laughs> bestiary is probably correct. Okay. But there's no A, so I just am going to say bestiary. Because it's the best. It's the best. <laughs> it's the best Yeri ever. <laughs> it's the best Yeri ever. I, I said the name if you want to look at it. I was going to say, I would like to keep other pictures. Yes. And, and my copy Ooh. is fantastic. It is a super, super high-quality hardcover book. It's got terrific quality paper. The illustrations are great, and the typography is fantastic. It's probably one of the most beautiful books I own. For those of you who are a blind girl and can't see <laughs> what book they're reading, there are beautiful illustrations of all these exotic animals. Uh, there's one for each letter of the alphabet. Basically, so it is an, an alphabet of animals, and each animal has a description of the animal written by somebody in the past 500 years. Sometimes correct, sometimes incorrect. Combined together to kind of create scientific knowledge. Um, this book is basically the story of how people started recording animals, sharing information about animals, and how that information became more and more accurate as time went on. This is a compilation book. It just sort of combines different entries written by a lot of scientists and natural historians and gifted amateurs throughout the past five centuries. The opening has a discussion of how these guys went out and found animals and how they brought that data back and had it compiled into bestiaries or bestiaries. And at the end, after it goes through the animals, it also has a compendium of who these people were and what the circumstances that they wrote about these animals. Um, So it's almost an examination of how the human race has compiled knowledge, 
how accurate that knowledge has been throughout the ages. So mm -hmm. you've got guys that are going out on ships and exploring the universe. They're seeing, say, an armadillo. The guy looking at that armadillo doesn't have taxonomy. He doesn't have basically the language technology to say, mm -hmm. okay, this is from this genus and right. it weighs this many pounds because we all use the same weights and measurements, right, everybody? <laughs> he has to look at it and say, okay, it's got a really hard shell that's kind of curvy, so it sort of looks like a melon if it's all wrapped up, and it's kind of like a rat with a kind of like a, a pointed rat's head. They're going to use all these different comparisons. Looks like my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen my wife? <laughs> no, that's my armadillo. I wish. <laughs> what is he, an Hasidic Jew? Yeah. Hello. <laughs> you know Sh how it's so Shalom. <laughs> What's this Meshagas? <laughs> But they would take these descriptions of animals that were the best they could do, and then people who hadn't met them would read it and go, oh, I'm going to draw an armadillo, or oh. I'm going to then take this information and put it in my bestiary. So they they never even saw the animal, they would just draw it based, like, cops that, like, oh, he had, like, this well, sort of, yeah. and kind of hair. And remember, they don't, have, they don't have the technology yet, of language technology, to be able to describe it in a way that we do now, or have pictures. If these guys were good, they, they'd usually have a ship's painter who could draw it. But they're not able to capture everything, and maybe it's just they see it for a minute before it goes down to, under the sea. Classic armadillo. Classic armadillo. <laughs> Those, <laughs> they are shifty. <laughs> Deep sea dwelling armadillo. That's right. <laughs> and you know, in some cases, they just bring the carcass back, and after a long sea voyage of months and months, there's not much carcass left that really matches what the animal was. And when they would come home, you know, they would have people transcribe what the animal was, but there'd be spelling errors, there would be like the, the telephone game of just missing one <laughs> detail and exaggerating and so on. And so these guys would do the very best they could with what they had, because mm -hmm. getting a second opinion took years to get another armadillo. Maybe like if you were like an Englishman and you got like a French copy, was there maybe something that was lost in oh, translation? That's true. Yeah, absolutely, because uh, most of these people we're not sharing notes because yeah, you know it, right. you'd have to go find somebody who had found one because remember it's it's a much larger world back then it's much harder to get any information out of anybody so you would have to try to to find as many copies and then translate them hoping that your words equal what their words meant right. at the time as well right. Uh, that's one reason why, when you look at old illustrations of animals, that the proportions are off, obviously. The eyes are too big, and some of them just don't have the right stances and so on. Um, and what's really fun is what they get right is often right next to what they get wrong. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, and if I could just read an excerpt from the elephant page. Elephant. The elephant is the biggest of all four-footed beasts. By the way, four is spelled F-O-U-R-E. Um, this is this is a, a fun English uh, words by Richard Eden from the 1570s. His four legs are longer than his hinder. His hinder. Uh, <laughs> he hath ankles in the lower parts of his hinder legs, legs spelled L-E-G-G-E-S, and five toes on his feet undivided. His snout or trunk, T-R-O-O-N-K-E, is so long and in such form that it is to him as the stead of a handle. In other words, instead of having a hand, he can use his trunk. Uh, For he neither eateth nor drinketh, but by bringing his trunk to his mouth, therewith he helpeth by his maester or keeper, therewith he overthroweth trees. Of all beasts, they are the most gentle and practical, for by many sundry ways they are taught and do understand inasmuch that they learn to do due honor to a king, in other words, they can bow, which is how you get on an elephant, and are of quick sense and sharpness of wit. They have continual war against dragons which desire their blood, because it is very cold, and therefore the dragon lying await as the elephant passes by, windeth his tail, being of exceeding length, about the hind legs of the elephant, and so staying him, thrusteth his head into his trunk, and exhausteth his breath, or else bite him in the ear, whereunto he cannot reach with his trunk, and when the elephant waxes faint, in other words, when he faints, he falleth down on the serpent, being now full of blood, and with the poise of his body breaking him, so that his own blood with the blood of the elephant runneth out of him mingled together, which being cold is congealed into that substance which apothecaries call sanguis draconis. <laughs> That was the most epic description <laughs> of an elephant I've ever read. True story. <laughs> True story. I just saw so, the elephant's so elephant, life. Right? Yeah, yeah, an elephant. Yeah, classic elephant. Never the, knows. <laughs> dragon prey. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, dragon prey. Yeah. Now, like, maybe he's going after crocodiles? But at the same time, I'm pretty sure that oh. even if it isn't crocodiles, yeah. uh, most of that probably isn't right. But that first half, yes. though, like yes. the first half is perfect. Yes. The second half is when things just sort of go crazier. That's really neat. Um, and that's kind of the real fun of this book is seeing the differences between now and then. He needed yeah. the OED. Oh, absolutely right. Absolutely <laughs> right. I find it interesting that you both selected 
books that had to do about <laughs> order and reference. Yeah. The reason I chose mm-hmm. this book is because every book so far in this podcast has had spies in it so far. <gasps> okay. For, for him. And so I looked Undercover at this. Undercover beast years. Exactly right. <laughs> so I, I looked at this and I said, you know what? There is no way <laughs> there are any spies in here. And then I got to the back. <laughs> uh, and it talks about the guys doing this world traveling, and chances spies are most of these the guys end. were spies. So, <laughs> yeah, well, I tried. Good job. I did try. It's a little Easter egg in every I episode. Guess, I Who guess. had an interest in zoology? Yeah, but it, was really it really just happened that we kind of both picked, yeah, like dictionary type yeah. books, reference based yeah, material. Exactly. I'm surprised you guys didn't. Yeah, didn't you get the memo? <laughs> Didn't. Come on, guys. <laughs> yeah. well, I guess there's a dictionary base. It's got words in it. <laughs> I, I used my dictionary while I read it. <laughs> I Same thing. But, but this book really made me kind of think about how information was passed on then and what made it not trustworthy is almost the exact inverse nowadays of why information is untrustworthy to us now. Like theirs is because it was so hard to fact check and so hard to get more accounts. Nowadays, it's hard for us to get information because there's so much of it and yeah. so much of it is false. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's hard to fact check anything because if I look up something online, I'm going to be able to find pages that are arguing for and against something very easily. Prints, the pictures. Yeah. Uh, singular yeah. artist who yep. did that. Uh, they're very pretty. Right, there's a thing at the end. Very detailed pen and ink drawings. They are. I mean, I, I'm a sucker for black and white pen and yeah. ink drawings. I love those very, very much. Ellen James Robinson, that's right. He did a great job. I'm a sucker for pen and ink, and that's just beautiful. Yeah. They're <laughs> lovely. Oh, it's really Great for an audio podcast. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I'm trying. But I could just read one more excerpt that... I'm sorry, we're up. Oh, that's right. Anymore, we have to get the copyright. It's you, and I can never find you. I don't know, there's just something wrong. I'm right here. I know. It's right there. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so this is the unicorn. And I think the, the unicorn kind of nicely touches on this idea. Unicorn. Great account and much profit is made of unicorn horn, at least of that which beareth the same name thereof. Wherein, notwithstanding, many, I perceive, suspect an imposture, and some conceive there's no such animal existent. Herein, therefore, to draw up our determinations, besides the several places of scripture mentioning this animal, which some perhaps may contend to only be meant of the rhinoceros, we are so far from denying there is a unicorn at all that we affirm there are many kinds thereof. In the number of quadrupeds we concede of no less than five, that is the Indian ox, the Indian ass, the rhinoceros, the oryx, and that which is eminently turned monoceros or unicornus. Some of the list of fishes and some unicorns we allow even among insects, as are four kinds of nasicornius beetles. Since, therefore, there be many unicorns, since that whereof ye appropriate the horn is so variously described that it is sometimes either neither to have been seen by two persons, or not to have been seen on one animal, with what security a man may rely on this remedy, the mistress of fools hath already instructed some and to wisdom, which is never too wise to learn, and is not too late to consider. Basically, he's saying, yeah, there's unicorns. Tons of them, all over the place. <laughs> all different kinds. There's bugs, there's fish, all different kinds of unicorns. I think that's interesting that he kind of almost makes the point of what we have now, of there being way too much information mm. and too many different perspectives on it, on, on this book that kind of gives almost the exact opposite idea. Do you ever think, like, rhinos are actually the real unicorns, but then you, like, Photoshop them and then you get exactly the unicorn right. horse? That's exactly right. That's why there's so much rhinoceros shaming going on right That's now. That's right. You never see a rhinoceros in Victoria's Secret, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I'm not sure I've seen a unicorn in one either. <laughs> <laughs> we don't really frequent that store. No. We go to Victor's Secret. <laughs> Victor's Secret. That's, that's where I got these pants. <laughs> Well, that about wraps up this episode of Book Reports Podcast. Uh, thanks again to the Tim and ladies for coming along. Thanks, Abby. Thanks, Rory. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, it's fantastic having you on the show. It was really fun to hear your perspective on a, a book that I probably will never read. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's why we had you read That's it. That's why we so had you read it. That's what we're for. That's what we're for. Okay. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Do you guys have anything, like any projects you're on that you want to promote on the podcast at all? Anything like that? Oh, no. <laughs> Anything you're working on? Okay. Roy's always writing, and yeah. she's been in the quest for a possible publisher. I think wow. she has what are you writing? two manuscripts done now. Um, one done, and then like three others I'm working on. Can anybody find this stuff online? Not yet. At all? No, okay. Not yet. you got to pay okay. for it. <laughs> no, I mean, if anybody really wants to be a preliminary reader for me, I'd love advice, and I'm willing to, because I have, I keep it online on Google Drive that I share it with anybody okay. who wants to. Wow. So what are you, what are you writing? Historical fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Historical <laughs> fantasy fiction. I will have.
happily read over that. Okay. Happily. That All sounds right. fantastic. Definitely fantasy. Oh, it sounds fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have a blog or any kind of, of online presence people can go to to look for updates on your work? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe by the time this yeah, episode comes out, maybe. she will have created something. <laughs> That's a good idea. I mean, I'm, I'm part of the writer's forum called, this is a really epic name, Legend Fire. Mm, whoa. And I post a lot of like excerpts of my work and get feedback and give other people feedback on their work. So That's pretty cool. Legend Fire. Ivy, are you working on anything? My autobiography? So okay. No. no. <laughs> Next, no. next month. The next Life and Times of Ivy Dan. <laughs> no, that'd be a scary book. <laughs> Murdery, the <laughs> Ivy Tan books. <laughs> All the Splutniks, Splutniks, and Andal, right? <laughs> Idaho hate by uh, Ivy Tan books. Is, is this going to be a family friendly book or are there Dobbies in it? <laughs> Definitely family friendly. Yes. But, not if you're from Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that wraps up this episode. Uh, you can find us on SoundCloud and iTunes. Please, please rate us on iTunes and give us some reviews. It helps people find the show quicker. And if you can't write, uh, have a friend do it. <laughs> Facebook, please like us on Facebook. That'd be terrific. We love to be able to see that people do, in fact, like us. It keeps us waking up every morning. Uh, <laughs> You can also contact us through email, uh, which is bookreportspodcast at gmail.com. Feel free to comment on how great we are or how handsome we may be. Feel free to conjecture about that. You blind girl. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all you blind French girls from the uh, 1940s out there. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can also find my work on skullduggeryinthesmoke.blogspot.com, which is my blog for my game writing. Uh, our show music is by Kevin McLeod. You can find his music at incomputech.com. And... And I think that's about everything. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so thanks a lot for listening to this month's episode of Book Reports Podcast. If we could have one of you say tonight on Book Reports Podcast and the other one say... Are we saying it together? Oh, even better. He could. <laughs> what are you saying? Tonight what? on Book Reports Podcast. And can you say, and much, much more? You spelled podcast wrong. Everybody. I think you'll find that my bad handwriting is covering up for my bad spelling, actually. <laughs> and much, much more. One more time. <laughs> With no laughter. I can't make my laugh stop. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> Can you do it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Think, think sad and All right, think about the book you just read. Oh, everyone's dying. <laughs> I think that's going to be the end of the episode. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. And much, much more. I can't do it. <laughs> just, and right. much, much. <laughs>